It's a Friday morning. We're in Christchurch. And we're going to talk about your musical life. So I've known you for most of your musical life. But uh, where should we start? Should we talk about why you started playing the trumpet? Was the, was the trumpet the first thing or did you play the recorder? I played the recorder for, oh, I suppose, about two years at CSM or CSIM as it was then. Yeah. Um, and, um, Were you a natural? On the recorder? I had no idea, but I was able to learn the notes and play tunes. Yes. So. Oh, that's, that's called being a natural, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then during that process, um, over those couple of years, um, the, the boy next door, the oldest son of the family next door, uh, came home from, I think, probably his first week at secondary school at um, Shirley Boys High School, of all, of all places. Um, there's an ongoing connection with that, of course. Um, with this monstrous tuba, and proceeded to practice it fairly regularly in his bedroom during the week and all the rest of it. And I fell in love with this marvellous, deep sort of sounding instrument and, and, and all the noises it could make. And so I started pestering my parents to you know, move from the recorder to the tuba. Um, I was, what, eight at the time, maybe nine, and was told that it was probably too big for me and that I should start on something smaller. So at some stage, um, um, I was at school one day and Douglas Kelly turned up and uh, I was um, asked to go down to the office to meet him. And he spent maybe about 10 minutes with me sort of examining teeth and looking at jaws. And trying so to can, can I just explain to those people who were not lucky enough to meet uh, uh, Doug Kelly, was that he was the music advisor for Canterbury, wasn't he? Correct, yes. yes. But he was also, um, a, um, I believe, the second trumpet teacher that had been employed by CSIM. Um, previously, Frank Dennis had done it for a year or so, and, and then not enough students wanted to learn that fell over. Um, Doug, of course, a very very capable musician and trumpet player was wanting to get a trumpet program started and so he was looking for people to go into his i believe first class that he was going to sort of start off and this would be in the late 60s i suppose about 1967 it could have been and so anyway so i was one of the guinea pigs in that class really yes yes, yes. should we just talk a little bit about doug because he just mm. passed away recently yes, yes. but he he was such a Gentleman, wasn't he? Yes. And, and such an accomplished musician, as yes, you said. Yes, you know. yes, yes. Across, across a wide range of, of skills. Um, he uh, was very able, was a, an accomplished pianist. Um, I think he, in fact, was the accomplished the first time I did a great exam, was it, uh, grade two. Um, but um, but a skillful arranger, not just in the jazz field, but um, in sort of lighter classical style of, of, of writing as well. Um, and yes, it was really quite outstanding trumpeter um, who, um, for uh, whatever reason, chose to live in Christchurch to the benefit of quite a few of us. That's right. Um, I remember him visiting my primary school to hear our recorder group to see if we were suitable to play in the school's concert at the Civic Theatre, I think. Mm. And I, I remember that day quite clearly. This yes. important man came yes. along. Yeah. <laughs> and he was very active as a um, music advisor. He didn't just stay in his office in, in the um, education department or education board or whatever it was that uh, had those roles. Um, he got out and about throughout Canterbury and Westland as, as well um, and um, I think had a huge impact um, on the musical lives of a lot of children because of that, mm. um, because the support was there for people who may not have been particularly strong musicians themselves but you would know, come up with arrangements or something or, you know, find instruments for, for, for people. But that actually like leads to my next question, Mark, because do you remember your first trumpet? Did it belong to the school or did you uh, have to? No, no. My parents um, got very carried away and bought me a brand new one. So, do you remember yeah. that trumpet? Yes, what I was? remember that. It was a Chinese Skylark. Well, that actually wasn't called a Skylark. It was just called a Lark. Right. Um, it weighed a tonne, um, but it worked. It worked. And yeah, that's the main thing, I guess. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I played that instrument for oh, two or three years, I think. Because getting buying instruments was not actually all that straightforward at that time in Christchurch. They were expensive and hard yeah, to come by. Well, been, but yes. being a child, none of that was my concern. All oh, time. so <laughs> <laughs> I just came home one day from school and there was this case there, and when I opened up, there was this really shiny trumpet inside it, which yes. I thought was pretty cool. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And so, were you a natural at uh, playing the trumpet? Um, it didn't seem to be too hard. Well, it's, uh, it, it, it's one of those odd things where the first lesson seems to go brilliantly well, and then you spend the next two weeks trying to sort of get it to work. Yes. But eventually it did work and you know, some, some things seemed to work pretty well, it didn't sound out of it, it didn't, wasn't ever really a major problem at all. Um, but again, you can't always gauge that, I mean, 
people on the other side of it, but I thought it was awful. I don't know. Did your neighbours move by any chance? No, they didn't. <laughs> no. For sale so, signs go up on no, them. No, you know, so, no, no, for sale signs. So. <laughs> so I think you were very, very talented then. Um, and uh, so, so, Mark, do you remember the first time you played in a group? Um, I can remember playing a recorder in a group for the first time, and I've got very vivid memories of a Cal Stadium concert, which the CSM office now has this great big photo of. Actually, no, that was uh, no, no, the concert I played the recorder was earlier because that's photos with me actually holding a trumpet. Right. Um, but um, the um, that concert with the recorder where. Um, um, and of course, with these great big mast arrangements of pieces. Yes. And, and this particular year was the march from the um, Hathitech Symphony. And, and you've not experienced music if you haven't been in a group of about 50 recorder players all going dum, dum, da dum, 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 dum. You really have not lived if you haven't. <laughs> um, people today seem to think it's a really weird thing to have enjoyed, but it was fantastic. I thought it was. A, it, it's kind of like you're involved in the energy of the music and the excitement of it, but there's also part of you thinking, this is nuts. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, but nuts in a good way. You know? Yes. Yeah. I mean, the fact that so many Christchurch musicians went through that bizarre experience, and it was bizarre. It was. I mean, do you remember the conductors out the front? You know, there'd be, yes. there'd be several conductors yes. with signs That's saying, right, yes. letter B, yes. letter C, right. you know. Yes. And, yes. Uh, yes, and you'd be watching. That was the other weird thing, is that you'd actually watch for the sign to go up, and it came down crunch on the down <laughs> yeah. um, and you'd start playing the letter B if that was the letter that came down. Yes. yes. Yeah. So, so tell me, um, that was the first experience, but what about playing the trumpet? So playing the trumpet... Um, Did you get into orchestra eight or something like um, that and work your way out? I can't out? remember it was eight or seven the first one, yes. but yes, yes, it was very much like that. Um, I, th I was very fortunate in perhaps the school that I went to um, had a, a, um, a teacher who was also an amateur musician who, who was you know, one of the stronger ones, perhaps in Christchurch at the time, a man called Bob Crichton. And um, by the second year, I think, of playing the trumpet, he, he decided that I was good enough to be in that school orchestra, which at that stage, of course, had a vast array of recorders, but there was a cellist, I think, a couple of violins and a flute and all the rest of that. Um, so between him and Doug Kelly, I suddenly found myself playing um, the solo from the um, um, Grand March from Aida. Yes. And that's probably the first major performance on the trumpet that I did that I actually had any recollection of. Partly because it seemed to bring the house down in the old Civic Theatre when we did it at the primary school's festival. That yes. Year. And then on my way out to meet my family, and then I was kept on being stopped by people saying how fantastic it was and all the rest of it. And, and I just tried to get to my family so we could go home. It was, yeah, it was sort of your first experience of yeah. being a superstar. Yes, yeah, something like that. Yeah. Yes. But and what an what an empowering experience for a young Mark. I guess it is. Yes. Yes. yes because it, it, it I mean validates you and the, what the fact that you think this is actually pretty cool even. You know, some of your mates at school who are more into rugby don't think it's cool, but yes, it's a real, real boost to your own self-esteem and and your determination that actually this is part of who you are and part of your world, and that just carries on through. Yes, and that's why um, primary musical um, experiences are so important. It's too late when students get to well, some obviously get to secondary before they find an instrument, and then you know still do extremely well. But but for a lot of children, if, if you don't get then seeing themselves as an instrumentalist of some kind early enough. There are so many social pressures as they get older in New Zealand to you know, be a sports person that by the, you, know, you leave it too late and they'll never actually get the full benefit of doing it. So true. You've got to get them as early as you can and give them experiences that are really positive. So from these very positive primary school experiences mm -hmm. where you bring the roof down at the Civic Theatre, uh, you... You end up at Shirley Boys High, yes. as it happens, the same school that I was at, yes. and I was a couple of years older than you. Yes. Uh, and uh, talk us through that. Um, was so that was that a, was that a great experience or or an average experience? Um, it, it 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 was a mixture at the time, perhaps. Um, partly because although the trumpet was quite important for me, it, it was kind of like I had school life and trumpet slash. CSI in life. It's almost like there were two two sort of divisions there. Um, and so um, I played the school orchestra, I played the school band. Um, it was, was a bit of an anomaly there because I insisted on staying on the trumpet. I wasn't going to swap to a corner to, to fit into the band, um, which may or may not have you know, upset, upset some people. But um, this is where perhaps sometimes um, trumpet players 
has had a reputation for being quite um, quite self-contained, I'll, I'll put it that way, and uh, a bit oblivious to other people's concerns of what they're doing is right for them. Let's put it that way. I think that's probably <laughs> the most polite way yeah. we can put those yeah, trumpet yes. characteristics. Yes. Um, so um, I think one of the really important things that came out of my um, time at Shirley, though, was um, once I got to sixth form, or you know, whatever it is now, year 12, um, Alec Robson, our music master, um, started us um, for um, UE Music um, on um, the um, first year um, harmony courses at Lovelock and all the rest of it. And while Lovelock is arguably um, a bit staid in terms of his approach to harmony and all the rest of it, um, it gave those of us who were doing it, there was only about four of us, I think, um, a really, really solid foundation in the whole business of harmony and structure and music and, and so on and so forth. Um, and that was a huge boon to do us, or to me certainly when we got to university where things were perhaps sometimes a little bit too esoteric for their own good. You know, they could have been actually much more useful to have just kept on giving us the, you know, the skills that you need if you're going to be a performing musician or, as it turned out in my case, you know, get involved in conducting as well. Um, so, um, yeah, I, in some respects I've probably learned more about, you know, basic harmony and everything within those last couple of years at Shirley than I did when I got to university. So you went to Canterbury University? I went to Canterbury, yes. And then after Canterbury University, were, were you doing any playing, uh, you were playing in the, in the, you would have been playing in the youth orchestra? Yes, I was playing yeah. in the youth orchestra. Um, in fact, in my seventh form year, um, and I can't remember when this happened, but in terms of professional music and Christchurch orchestral music, um, in the mid late 70s, um, um, Arts Council decided, decided um, to fund a new orchestra here in Christchurch, um, which came out as the Canterbury Trust Orchestra, um, um, which was kind of for a period of time in opposition to the Christchurch Symphony Orchestra, which had grown out of the Symphony Orchestra, which had grown out of John Ritchie Strings and had this long tradition of, of presenting music. Um, so anyway, at the beginning of 77, 76, sorry, when it was my last year at uh, secondary school, um, I found myself called in as um, a um, third or fourth trumpet player for something that the um, Canterbury Trust Orchestra was doing. Um, and then not long after that, I also found myself playing in the Christchurch Symphony Orchestra, uh, which was an interesting place to be because a lot of people had taken sides as to which orchestra they were going to play. Yes, I mean, Christchurch was obviously capable of supporting two professional orchestras. Yes, of course. <laughs> it was a terrible time in Christchurch, wasn't it? Stupid decisions. Well, yes, yeah. you know, I don't know if it ranks right at the top of some of the stupid decisions that Arts Council have made, but <laughs> it's, it's not one of the low ones as far as Christchurch is concerned. That's right. Um, but um, yeah, um, so, um, and um, again, th this probably you know, marks out my personality for good or bad, but I couldn't see any reason f as a freelance musician. This essentially is what we were, it wasn't like there was a contract for an individual who's perhaps playing only second or third trumpet. Um, I played for whoever phoned up. First mm. and first served, and um, that may not have been uh, morally correct or not, but I, you know, I got to play an awful lot of repertoire as a result of that decision, which I think was, you know, probably very good for me in my development as a musician. Um, and of course, you got to work with diff different conductors. That, as well. But that was—I was just going to follow on with that because uh, at what point did you start getting interested in conducting? Um, that had already happened at about 1976, so you know, six formish. Um, at that time, Peter Zortz was um, in charge of um, um, Christchurch School. He was the musical director for CSA and um, was wanting to train up some young conductors to help conduct the orchestras and, you know, just sort of develop, um, I guess, a, a number of us. And um, so that was the first experience I had. We had a few lessons with him. We got thrown in the deep end with um, parts of Orchestra 5 and or Orchestra 6 and so on to sort of work with them with pieces um, and I can remember doing that for a, you know, a, a good year or two using the, um, there was an upstairs room in the old student union which is where the Ducks Deluxe was at the Art Centre and uh, you know, we used to crowd in there and, uh, and hack our way through pieces, you know, maybe hack is too strong a word, but, <laughs> but I'm sure it wasn't, um, you know, it would have been you know, challenging but for both us as conductors but also for the poor children who were stuck in front of us. So at that time when you were playing in both orchestras, mm -hmm. I, I think I know the answer, but you, you, you had a you had a favourite conductor to, to play for. Um yes, of all the conductors I worked with around that time, Major Chodarsky. That's what I thought, that thought you'd say. Be easily the most um, inspiring to work with, yeah. So for those people who don't 
remember him or know him. Um, he's passed on now, I believe. But uh, um, it, it, tell me about him. Um, so um, he arrived in 75 or 76 in Christchurch um, to conduct the Christchurch Symphony. Or, 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 was it Christchurch Symphony? It was the Christchurch Symphony, yeah. 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 Um, I think at that stage his, his career he was based somewhere in Australia. Um, but um, he, he came here. Um, I think the hope was that they might you know, get him to settle here. Um, but I don't think that was ever going to be realistic because there wasn't enough work for you know, for someone of, of um, his um, level, and you, you'd expect someone with that kind of professional background to go into school teaching or something like that. Um, but he came along to CSM and worked with Orchestra 2, as it was then, um, uh, for a rehearsal, and I can't remember either, um, what it was that we played at that time. Um, but um, as a consequence, the following year he was conducting Orchestra 2, and um, you know, not to disparage the conductors we'd had up to that point, but he was, you know, fully professionally trained and now on a completely different level, um, both technically and musically. Mm. Um, and at that stage, Orchestra 2 moved into rehearsing in the Civil Theatre. Um, um, and um, I still remember um, the, the first work we did with him was the Hungarian Dance Number no. 5 of Brahms, uh, which doesn't have a lot for the trumpet in it, but it was, you know, again, one of these really cool pieces of music that, even today, it's still fun to conduct it. Yes. The chance. Yes. Yeah. And uh, um, so, you you must have been pretty busy because you would have been teaching as well, were you? Did you have students? Um, so at, I can't remember if this was seventy six or seventy seven, but somewhere around there, um, Doug started to um, ask me to, you know, sit in all classes as an assistant. And then eventually, I was given my own groups to, to teach on Saturday morning. I wasn't doing any private teaching at that stage. That, that sort of grew later, um, and that was a lot of fun too. Um, at that point, where I think we were in the Arts Centre, um, um, just an anecdote there, but it came in one winter's morning to find a dead pigeon on the floor of the room that I was about to start taking a trumpet class in. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, that's kind of where that started. Yes. And um, I don't know if I was good, bad, or indifferent, or there was just a complete shortage of other people. But um, but you enjoyed it. I enjoyed it, and once I started doing that, I was always asked to carry on year after year after year. So, and you haven't stopped at the point where I some. I think I don't know if I've got to three three hours of tuition on Saturday morning, but we certainly got on to two. They were busy mornings, weren't they? Because you'd you'd teach and then you'd go off and play in some yeah. group or. And and, yeah. and by that stage, you were used to it. as a child um, when the um, school was still based on Cranbourne Square, out of the um, old Norman Training College, which was fell over in the quakes, um, but. Um, you know, Saturday morning you'd spend mostly in that building. You'd have like orchestra in one of the large rooms on the ground floor, and then you'd go to one of the other rooms for a trumpet lesson, and then there'd be time to go and sort of get a, a, a donut down at the corner of High Street, um, um, Victoria Street, and Kilmore Street, and then you'd go back for an hour's theory lesson. Or yes. So the whole morning was taken. And socially, it was great. Socially, wasn't it? Yeah. It was. It was. It was. It was, it was, it was, it was fun. Yes. And friendships that were made back then. You know. Last. Many, many of them still last today. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so, so Mark, uh, you then went overseas at some point. Yes. So, so yes. can so, you t t tell us about that? Yes. So, um, from was it seventy seven? I must have been yeah, nineteen seventy seven. I think was my first year at university, and um, studies got interrupted then in seventy nine. I um, foolishly got in the way of somebody's shot at goal in the sixth form. Um, in a soccer match, and although it wasn't apparent at the time, the um, violence of the ball hitting my head had caused the retina in my right eye to, to, um, to tear, um, and it was a couple of years before we picked up on this, and so, um, yeah, so I, I, I did kind of sort of miss a period of study there, which meant that by the time I was ready to leave, I hadn't completed all the requirements of the degree, but I went anyway, uh, and uh, so we were talking just before about how in 1979 um, Peter Adams and I went to, um, over to um, Adelaide and that was for me to have an opportunity of having some lessons with a Swedish trumpeter and teacher called Boo Nielsen and they went extremely well. Um, Boo had spent a lot of time in his life studying the whole mechanics of how you make sound on a trumpet, how to make it work and all the rest of it. Various technical exercises that were of value and others that perhaps weren't, and all the rest of it. So, it, it, by the time I sort of started lessons with him, he was um, very much on top of his 
as gay as it were. It's got everything sus. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and that was quite apparent to me, so I thought, right, well, in that case, um, I've worked out who I'm going to go and study with um, after I finish at Canterbury. Um, and as I said, when I left Canterbury, I had not completed the degree. Um, remarkably, coming back the um, week after I'd been in Australia with Boo, uh, I'm out at Canterbury to sort of check results and the rest of it, and there's this post on the wall advertising scholarships from the Swedish Institute. So, <laughs> so, um, How timely. That, that seemed, um, you know, a sign. confirmation of, of, of this. So I applied for one of those scholarships and, and got it, which was nice. Uh, and that funded my studies in Sweden with Boo for three years. Mm. Um, at the end of that, um, I came back to um, play in the Auckland Philharmonia, and I was with them for, what, three years, I think, something like that. Yeah. And then back to Christchurch. And what brought, what brought you back to Christchurch? Um, the weather, the tropical the, weather? Yes, yes, definitely. <laughs> yes, 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 the, yes the, the wonderful scenery of, of, of the urban landscape. Um, it was a combination of things. Um, things hadn't gone so well for me in Auckland for a number of reasons. Um, and it occurred to me that I needed to come back and finish my degree off um, if I was going to then progress on to um, perhaps do some postgraduate studies back overseas and mm. conducting. Um, but um, um, life got in the way of that. Opportunities came thick and fast for somebody who seemed to know what they were doing. I don't know that I did, but anyway, so I got lots of opportunities to conduct here, and, you know, um, musical societies and, and, and so on. And uh, as, as it transpired, it was a number of years later before I managed to get overseas, and it was just for a uh, summer school in Aspen um, in 1995. But that was incredibly inspiring in terms of um, sort of deciding not to um, perhaps pursue um, the musical line, which I think I probably could have done a little bit longer if I'd so wished. But um, yeah, no, that, that brought me back into focus into the mainstream classical music. Due to life events, um, I wasn't able to get back for a second year, um, which I had hoped I might have been able to do, but uh, well, you build the career with the life you find for good in the yes. middle of, don't you? So, um, yes. Yeah, so. yes. Mm. And you've been back in Christchurch since, since so, then? So, so yes. Yeah. 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 And, uh, and I know that I've sort of caught you, you just sort of uh, came in eating your breakfast and you're about to go off and teach. And uh, so... Um, this is a life that, and you conduct uh, various groups and highly uh, appreciated uh, by so many people. Um, uh, is, is if someone was to wave a magic wand, is this something that Mark would like to do in the future that he hasn't yet done? Um, I would have liked to have been able to have pursued a um, fully professional conducting career which wouldn't have involved teaching in schools and, yes. and, and um, might still have involved some performance on trumpet, but probably wouldn't have involved teaching it at all. Um, but as I say, um, you know, sometimes things outside of your musical life um, create issues that you have to address and you have to make decisions. And you know, I made a, a, a particular decision to remain here yes. and um, you know, construct what I could out of that. And um, yeah, but if I'd had the opportunity or had been more, um, I guess, you know, bloody-minded about some things, shall we say, um, then you know, certainly pursuing, seeing how far I might have got as a professional conductor would have been an interesting thing to have done. So, and tell me, these days, you've immersed yourself in music all your life. Mm. Do you listen to music at all? Yes, as much as I can. So what, what are you um, listening to at the moment? What's what, your favourite? What am I listening to at the moment? I'm listening to a lot of Shostakovich Fifth Symphony because I'm conducting that for the first time at the end of July up here in New Plymouth. Um, that's the, fantastic. Yeah, that's with the New Zealand Doctors Orchestra. Uh, so I'm listening to that quite a bit. Um, but um, I get the BBC Music magazine once a month and quite often we'll have the CD of that in the car. At the moment, it, the CD has got um, an arrangement of... Um, one of Bach's works for um, violin and viola um, by Halverson, who is a Norwegian composer. Um, and there's a Beethoven trio in there, and I think one of the um, uh, Mozart, um, yes, Mozart piano um, quintets or quartets as well. Yes, so, yeah, so yeah, it's, it's, it's eclectic. A di <laughs> diverse range um, of music. Yeah, yeah. Um, at any given moment, it could be John Adams that I'm listening to. Um, yes. Yeah. Thomas Adairs um, and um, so on, and, yeah, 
Einfluss wirkt. Und, ähm, ja, ja, das war gut, dass ich in Amerika komponiere. Das ist eine really exciting Sache für uns. Um, later this year, I'm conducting the um, Plow That Broke the Plants. I think it's the title of Virgil Thompson in Latin America. And we do compose this piece to go with some uh, with a movie about the sort of, um, well, I guess, you know, environmental degradation of Oklahoma and all the rest of it, which um, um, was part of a program that happened in the 1930s for artists to be able to actually keep working. And the State Department funded these sorts of things um, in, in America. Um, so, yeah. So there was quite a lot of, um, if you like, pure artistic stuff that was happened happened in that period, and this is one work that's always kind of fascinated me. So, so Mark, some people of our generation uh, are retiring at this point in time, mm. and they're sort of getting out the jigsaw puzzles and things like that. Mm. No, no plans for that. No plans for that. No. Possibly a little less teaching, but um, um, but no, no plans to retire as such. Well, congratulations for everything that you've done and continue to do for music here in Christchurch. Thank you, Mark.